Welcome back to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 31st meeting of 2018. Before we move to the sixth item in the agenda, remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. The sixth item on their agenda today is to consider a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to the storage of carbon dioxide uh, regulations 2018. And we're joined by uh, Stuart Mackay this afternoon, the Head of Cap Carbon Capture, Utilisation and Storage for the Scottish Government. Thank you for coming along to answer our questions. Um, I, I guess my first question is around the, the timing of the receipt of this notification to, to the committee. Um, it was sent on the Thursday, the 22nd of November, with the expectation that it be laid at Westminster a week later on the 29th of November. So um, I'd like light some background as to why you think there's been so little time given to the, the Parliament to consider this notification. I, we, we received the, thank, thank you for the question, thank you for the invite today um, to, to speak. We received the notifica notification from the UK government on the 6th of November, which is outside the 28 day period to begin with. I went through the usual processes. Um, I had to consult uh, legal, um, this, this Scottish Government legal department and other um, policy officials and eventually get it through to the Minister. So it was very late in getting to you. Right. So um, I, I suppose I want to know what, what discussion uh, the Scottish Government had with Bayes on, on the scope to lay the, lay the SI um, at this date um, given that Parliament, we have a very short period of time in which to actually scrutinise and consider it. Uh, of course, of course. We have conveyed to the UK Government that this is not ideal um, and that it is challenging. Yeah. And we have sent a holding response to the UK Government and it conveys that message. To give you any idea as to why this, this, to see this one has been particularly urgent, I think it's because of the acceleration in this policy at the moment from the UK government. I did send a note um, as an update um, to the committee, um, which sets out the activity that's happened in the last sort of 12 months in the, in the UK government. And this is a policy area that is accelerating in its development at the moment. Yeah. and. Um the correspondence that, that, we, that we got um, didn't indicate whether the draft SI, the actual draft SI had actually been shared by the Scottish Government uh, with, from the UK Government, has it? We haven't got the, the draft SI yet. Right, so like ourselves in a situation of not actually seeing the, the content of it. Right, I'll, I'll pass on to some questions, given that you've said that. Um, so can, I, can I just correct that? We, we have the draft SI, and right. we have been consulted on that. Um, over the past um, few weeks, but we haven't got the final. You haven't got the final one. That's what I meant to say. Okay. Apologies. Yeah. Are you content with the drafting as it is, then, that you've seen thus far? Yes. It appears to be minor uh, and, and a technical um, change rather than anything else. Okay. Um, and our legal department is satisfied also. Okay. Many thanks. Um, questions from Anagus MacDonald? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> hello. Um, with regard to the categorisation of the notification, um, it's been classified as a Category A, um, and uh, the notification indicates that the SI would transfer power, obviously, to the UK Secretary of State. Now, um, I'd be keen to know what are the reasons for classifying the notification as Category A rather than Category B, uh, given that it creates new powers for the UK Secretary of State? The, um, what, what this addresses is, is some minor changes um, in a technical nature. So part of the legislation means that, um, that the, the UK government would have to consult with the European Commission. So this is about changing that to Secretary of State. But where it affects the Scottish government is to do with the, the pipelines. So if, if the pipelines cross the 12 nautical mile limit of the Scottish Government, then it has an interaction with Scottish ministers. And because these pipelines will naturally come from onshore, 
in Scotland in this case, to offshore, crossing the boundary, the 12 nautical miles, into the UK continental shelf, they straddle the boundary. So in the process of accessing these pipelines and in the termination and decommissioning of these pipelines at the eventual end of life, there will be an interaction with the Scottish Government, naturally. So this, this is where these two things meet. But what it doesn't affect is the Scottish Government's licensing ability or capability um, um, or competence. Because we also have licensing powers for CCS, but this refers to licensing CCS activities within the 12 nautical miles of this, the territorial seas of Scotland. So it's very much because pipelines go across these boundaries, there will always be this interaction. Okay. What kind of interaction? Is that a case of you know, permissions, uh, agreement? It, it would be um, consultation and, and agreement to decommission, for instance, in a certain way, to make sure that Scottish ministers are content with that. Um, and to for, for access, for maintenance, etc., as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just okay. I appreciate the clarification, but given the, the, there is a, what I would class as a complexity, I would have thought it would, should have been category B. But here we go. Okay. I think it's just because of the the sort of minor changes here in terms mm. of changing the European Commission, you know, consulting them to consulting the um, Secretary of State of Scotland for um, Secretary of State, UK government. Um, and it's always CCS, because it crosses these, and these boundaries between the 12 nautical mile limit um, and the UK continental shelf, it has always been a mixture of both governments agreeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Thank you. John Scott. Thank you. Uh, convener, um, and notwithstanding your answers to Angus MacDonald, uh, just for the record, because uh, you may already have answered some of these questions, what impact does the proposed uh, statutory instrument have on devolved areas, and what are the practical implications? It doesn't really have any impact, to be honest. Um, as I say, these, were always, these pipelines are always by agreement because they cross the, the both boundaries. So both governments are required in order to consent, in order to, to gain access, and in order to terminate and, and decommission, depending on which part of the sea that your, your activity takes place. And as I say, it does not affect the Scottish Minister's um, competencies in licensing CCS within their own jurisdiction. Right. Quite specifically, does the function of legislating to amend certain technical requirements in areas where the Oil and Gas Authority is the licensing authority impact in any way on devolved areas, in we, addition we, to what you've already said? We, do, we don't believe so. Um, there is reference within this legislation to updating technical innovations and uh, other matters with this technology. And the reference is that, that you would look to the, to the European Commission to gain these updates and, and you know, adopt them into your legislation. That part has changed because of this. So that would be to the UK government and the Scottish government to update these wherever this is relevant, in, in technical terms. And again, for the record, does the Scottish Government therefore anticipate having a role in the exercise of this power? For example, does it expect to be consulted on changes to UK technical requirements currently set out in the CCS Directive? I take it the answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes, and we've consulted with the UK Government on this throughout the years. Thank you. And finally, is it, the, is it the intention for Scottish ministers to have an equivalent power to modify technical requirements within the territorial sea adjacent to Scotland? And if so, how does the Scottish Government anticipate that these powers will interact in practice? It is our intention 
to address the same technical issues. Um, it's not a priority. We have um, other, other things that, that need to be done, done quicker than this. Um, there are no live projects of CCS um, injected CO2 into the geological formations, um, expected for a couple of years at best. So we, we feel we have time to address this. Thank you. Mark right, Ruskell. Um, so the notification uh, states that this also addresses um, minor EU exit-related amendments and also non-EU exit-related cross-referencing errors. Mm -hmm. Do you, what, what those are, in plain speak? C CCS, um, by its nature, is, is affected by a number of things. One of them is, is um, the ETS, which I think you committee has discussed. So a CCS um, project would would need an ETS permit, for instance, um, if, if there was a live one, a live project happening. Um, and the interaction between the ETS and what happens with the ETS connects CCS in that way. Is that, is that helpful? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's the that's the purpose of the of those additional amendments then, and yes. the cross-referencing errors? The, the cross-referencing, yes. Right, yeah. okay. And so, some of the cross-referencing, again, is to, is to take out the European Commission and put in place the, 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 um, the UK Government Secretary of State yeah. for this particular SI. Yeah, okay. I think that leads me neatly on to just asking a couple more questions about, about CCS then and the relationship okay. with the EU ETS and, and what indeed replaces that. Mm -hmm. um, so how will the current incentives on carbon storage sites to avoid carbon leakage uh, be replaced in the UK? Because we'll have a, a kind of carbon taxation mechanism. What, what's your understanding of how that will work? It, it's, not that, that it's not my exact area, but um, in order to try and help, the, the, the ETA, whatever replaces the ETS, um, the C, a CCS project will be part of that and will need a permit from um, wh whatever is, is decided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, wh like many large industrial projects. Right, OK. But there's still uncertainty around the proposed mechanism and what the impact of that may be in terms of capturing emissions, reducing emissions? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, uh, th there is. Um, but the, the only, I mean, from my point of view, I'm looking at CCS. We, the CCS projects need a permit for ETS. Mm -hmm. um, if, um, if ETS is replaced by something else, whatever that may be, that will stay the same. The CCS projects will still there's no intention to change that right. at all. So the intention and the effect will be the same then? Yeah, whatever that solution is, will be right. will, will address the CCS. There's no intention to, okay. to change that at all. Okay. I hope that's helpful. And, and is CCS leaky? Well, Inherently? I mean, would they, would you expect projects to be using ETS or, or some other mechanism or? It, it's um, it's there. It's there as as a. I don't want to use the word backstop. Mm. <laughs> it's the only word I could think of there. Um, it, it it needs to be there in, in place, but you have. I, I don't know if you're aware, but the Schleppner project from Norway has been storing CO2 for 20 years in the North Sea, without incident. Um, so our geologists tell us that this is a safe thing to do, right. and. The way that you would choose a store would have to be characterised in such a way that the geology is suitable. Um, so there's a, an awful lot of hurdles to get through before you can say that a site is suitable um, for this sort of activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Finlay Carson. Uh, Good afternoon. The, the notification relates to the proposed um, SI and states that it does not amend the Scottish equivalent to the licensing regulations for storage of carbon dioxide 
Scotland Regulations 2011. The regulations relate to the licensing of geological storage within the Scottish territorial waters and are expected to be amended in due course. Um, now, I know you've said there's nothing coming forward for the next few, few years, but are there any implications in not amending the relevant Scottish licensing concurrently to ensure cohesive licensing? Um, it's a matter of priority. So we, we, we have chosen to prioritise other things at the moment, but this is definitely on the list of, of things to do. Mm -hmm. it, it, it needs to happen, definitely. OK, any um, idea when? Um, I, I don't have an exact date, but in due course, it, it's already begun. OK, and, and there's no implications with it not being concurrent, no? We, we don't have any live projects right. at the moment storing CO2. We have a number of projects that are starting to be developed, which is very interesting, um, mm -hmm. but there's no live projects okay. operational. Okay, any other members got any other questions they want to ask? Or do you have anything that you want to say in relation to this that you haven't covered already, um, Mr Mackay? Just, just to reiterate you know, that, that it is a minor technical change and that we are addressing the Scottish part of that separately. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, that's been very helpful. Um, this concludes the items of the committee's agenda and public session. At its next meeting on the 4th of December, the committee will hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity on a number of environmental issues arising from the UK's exit from the European Union. Um, as previously agreed, the committee will now move into private session. I request the public gallery now be vacated. Thank you.